thank you for that, that introduction. It's always a bit dangerous when you <laughs> go over the top. In fact, I'm, I'm incapacitated in the sense I can't draw in this place because we are, we are communicating with, with the rest of the world and I can't, can't use my, my videos either. So this will be more or less a formal, formal speech, how formal ever I can be. Um, uh, I'm sorry I don't speak French. I learned French in 1960 in Chicago and uh, Madame Schiller was very proud of me because I was European and I could pronounce French a different way than the Americans. So it wasn't parlez-vous français, but my French is still, still sort of crude, so I'm not using French today. Uh, uh, as you said, I, have, I am a Finnish citizen, I am a resident of Sweden, I live in Denmark and I work in Norway. So this is sort of <laughs> the, the Scandinavian or Nordic sort of thing. And salutogenesis is, uh, if you don't know about it, there's a lot of literature I'm going to refer to, but actually it's the question about what creates good health? What responds to what creates good health? And that's the most, most important thing. Every time you do something, what creates good health? What would be in this situation? And I chose the picture, usually I have something more strict. This is Christmas two years ago and I'm Santa Claus and these are six of my nine grandchildren and they, they, they don't know, still don't know I was Santa Claus in this evening. <laughs> my children discovered it after a, few, a little while, there were four of them were there and they, was, they didn't know who Santa Claus was to be but I was there and the oldest and when I started speaking they of course realized it was me. Okay and uh, children around me and this is one of the most salutogenic situations I've been in. You know, this joy of Christmas, the joy of a grandchild, not knowing I'm there, and actually the spirit of this was, was a great moment. So that's why I put this picture on. As, as I said, I worked in Norway now. I'm retiring this year. I'm turning 70, so I am not allowed to continue working in a formal position. So I will be emeritus in a little while in this place. Yes. And the story of salutogenesis goes back to Aaron Antonovsky and uh, I had the joy of working with him from the Nordic School of Public Health for, for seven years before he died. He died very suddenly, he had cancer and uh, the first treatment of, of cytostatics killed him. And, and that was the end of the story and it was quite abrupt and, uh, and the whole sort of situation with a young research area was in chaos for a while. I had met him, I decided to put up uh, research courses at the Nordic School of Public Health. We worked with the five Nordic countries and from then on we moved on and continued his, his sort of his track and his salutogenic idea. And I'm going to sort of tell you what goes on in the world at the moment and then do a little of, of what I'm interested in right now. Uh, salutogenesis is also a umbrella concept. It's not only Antonovsky's sense of coherence theory, it's all theories that are based or, or approaches that are based on, on an asset or, or resource concept. And if you look at, under the umbrella, you see a lot of nice words. Uh, uh, salutogenesis is difficult to understand for the ordinary person. I always envy uh, one of the researchers in the area who, who, who invented uh, the word flourishing. He's working with mental health and it's much easier to work off, walk out in the city and ask if you are flourishing. But <laughs> if I ask you how is your sense of coherence or how is your salutogenesis, nobody answers. But we are talking about flourishing, how you make people flourish. And that's a good, one of the good approaches, very similar to Antonovsky and very much in line with uh, uh, mental health promotion. But this is the umbrella. Uh, a colleague of mine, ter mine turned the umbrella upside down and I tell her this is a waste packet, basket. I don't want to have a waste basket and I'm going to make it into, into one of these, you know this, I don't know the English or French word for it. It's sort of a, a, a shell where it all comes out. It's a, 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 sort, of, a sort of symbol of, 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 of being fertile and so on. I don't know the English word. I would draw it, but I can't do it here. Uh, this, uh, 
address you have down there is Monica Eriksson, who was working with me and still working with me for a long time. And we, after Antonovsky, we, we went into, into uh, research and looking at the research area. Is this only an idea? Is this just sort of uh, a fancy f thing and a fancy word? Is there any consistency in this, in this approach? And, and we started building up the knowledge of the area. Because I also work in, in, in uh, health promotion, I think it's important to say that the health promotion principles uh, as the process enabling people to gain control over their health determinants and improving their health in order to lead an active and productive life, what I call the genetic code of health promotion. That's the thing you have to know about health promotion. And then you have to interpret this. And we have made a, a salutogenic interpretation of this. It's actually about people in life uh, having their uh, health determines their resources when they are born, and then uh, they uh, they uh, they approach different life uh, life events which become life experiences, and you can and you and you have this in your life rucksack, and then you move on, and there are events that happen that you have to deal with. You have to look at: Do I have the capacity to do this? Uh, what are my determinants? What are my experiences? If I can't do it myself, can I ask the context to help me? And then you move forward. And here, the health becomes the process, and the sort of outcome is is to have a good life, active and productive life, as WHO says. Uh, I call it quality of life or the good life because I did quality of life research which actually went into the well-being and understanding of, of health in a different way. But health is less important in this aspect. We are dealing actually with life and not only the limited aspect of health. Again, if I make a complex picture, you would need to understand all these salutogenic concepts and Antonovsky's theories, but in fact you can put the salutogenic theory on the, the principles of health promotion and actually have a, a juxtaposition and a thing that works. It's the first time we actually have a good theory for health promotion. It would have been needed 31 years ago when you started off, but the people who were starting off were more interested in, in principles and policies and so on, and the theory and that thinking lacked behind and it took several years uh, before before we were actually building a, a consistent theory. And I claim that this is the best theory you could have for health promotion. And I'm, I'm sticking to this theory until you come with, come with something better. You need to come with something better. And just come on, stick up if you want to and if you dare to. Today I'm not that protective about this. I can open up the idea of health from of a salutogenesis and say, come on in, enter the scene and see and look at the world in a different way. Because we are actually moving in a, in a quite different way than before. Uh, this is the first uh, important book after Antonovsky's two books. He wrote two books uh, and many papers, but this is the first synthesis of what is the, what is the evidence base of salutogenesis. This is again Monika Eriksson who I worked with in, in for several years from the Nordic school and then on when I moved on to Finland and we worked together for, and we still work together, so we have a, at least 20, 25 years story behind ourselves. Unraveling the mystery of salutogenesis was the title of this, where we actually for the first time could say, okay, if you look at this, does it work? Does, do we have evidence of its, of its effectiveness? And we do, definitely do that. Uh, you can't find this book on, online, but, but uh, you can order it from Monika Eriksson. Uh, this is again the newest thing we have, uh, the Handbook of Salutogenesis. This is the work of the Global Working Group of Salutogenesis. We have about 60 or 70 authors in the book. We are seven seven editors. I'm one of them, and Maurice Mittelmark, who was the chair of IUHPE and president of IUHPE for a long time, was the driving force in this, in this book. And this is open access. You can go and, and just Google on the Handbook of Salutogenesis, Springer printed it, and if you want to take something of it, you just load down 
down what you want. If you want the whole book, you can also buy the whole book, but, but it's better, better and cheaper just to down, down on what you want. And we were surprised. In April, we had 159,000 downloads, and in September, we had 330,000 downloads on the book. And uh, this says, and probably at the time being, it's about half a million. And think about it, if you had print, printed a book last year, you would probably sell, you're happy if you sell 200, 300 or 500. And here we have half a million. So this is the power of the modern, of modern days. And, and is, is the internet changing your way of thinking? It's actually changing the way of communicating. This is a book that is not mine. It was just lying there. But, but in fact, this is the power of it. And we know that people can, if you have a question about whatever, okay, go and look into this book that covers the whole thing. It's a big book, you know. I was surprised when I saw it. But this is the, the sort of basis of our future. We are already thinking about and starting to, to do the second edition of this book. Uh, so it's, it's coming around. And go, please, if you, if you are interested, you go in and have a look. And I represent the Global Working Group on Cellulogenesis. It's, it has been running for 10 years. I, this, 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 uh, these brackets, they moved when I put it on the slide. So it's in fact, this upper part of the group are the editors and also the core group of, 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 the, of this global working group. And uh, then we have some, a few people who have been there and then we have new people coming in. Uh, Mathieu Roy from Canada is now a member of, of the Global Working Group. He was, the, he was, he was part of the initiator of, of the printing of this book, which is the first French book on salutogenesis. Uh, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a, 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 a version of the original, which is the Hitchhiker's Guide to Salutogenesis, which uh, I came out in 2010. Two languages. But we have it now in seven languages. It, we have it in English, French, Catalan, Spanish, uh, Norwegian, and Italian is coming this, this autumn before Christmas, and then the German is coming in January. I have, I have maybe we will get it in Chinese and, and also in Japanese, uh, so, but that is part of the future. But the other words, seven languages are there, and they are, they are almost ready now for printing. But this is now rather a big group, uh, and still we have we, we consider this a core group. We can work together, and we can actually continue to develop what we want to do in this area. Um, and w part of the work now you can't read all the details there, but we are working on a position paper on salutogenesis uh, that is bringing together the knowledge and thoughts and the ideas of how we, how we can move forward in, in the future. And one of the things is to work with the theory. Is the theory consistent? Are the instruments consistent? I always laugh when I say we, have, we need only one questionnaire in principle to cover this whole area. It's the original questionnaire of Aronofsky, a longer and shorter version of this. And when I look at, for instance, the area of health lit literacy, where you have about, where if you study work-based health literacy, you need about 150 questionnaires. So you end up, this area is a complete mess in my, in my, in my, in my opinion. But I'm, they are improving. I'm always nagging at health literacy and nagging and nagging. So theory is one area. Then we are looking at interventions, and there's a group of people working with that. And then we have a group working with uh, cellulogenesis in specific groups uh, and looking at how do we do create a collective sense of coherence instrument, measurement for that. And this, these people are mainly the people who were working with Aaron Antonovsky, who was still working in Beersheba in, in Israel. Shifra Sagi has been the, the, the leader of, of this group after Aronofsky. And she's, she would have been the natural person to continue this, but they were in such a shock when he died so suddenly that they actually couldn't pick up his his area. So they are, they are pretty happy that, that we actually started this international work and, and, and in a few years' time we were able to set up this global working group. But these are the, are, the, are the components of the position paper. It's actually work in progress, so I can't go into the details here, but 
when you read this, when you get these slides, you can go in and see who is doing what and what are they doing and how do we, how do you continue. I have a special interest uh, being a pediatrician and working with children, also neonatology before when I was young, and and uh, and also I'm interested in how the uh, the the salutogenic process starts. And, and in, in very beautiful words, you can say the primordial genesis of salutogenesis. I wrote a paper on this called Genesis, uh, and, uh, which, uh, which uh, I can refer to later on. But this is my idea, how actually did this start? Antonovsky himself said, I know nothing about children, and his original study was on, 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 on women in menopause, so it was adult people with life experience. But how does this process start? I will go into that a bit later. This is my sort of special interest area in this whole thing. Uh, now this is difficult to see, but another thing that we started in September this year, we had the meeting of, of the Global Working Group, is the STARS Society. STARS stands for mm, mm, uh, Salutogenic Theory and Research Society. Actually, I wanted to call this society the Salutogenic Society in, in originally many years ago when the Global Working Group started because uh, the Salutogenic Society has two things. It's a scientific society, but to understand we can think about how can we create societies that are, that are salutogenesis. The second question is more, is more important. This is a free open possibility to join this, this group and you have the web, web address here. And the person who is now in charge of, of the global working group is Georg Bauer. He is in Zurich in Switzerland. And he also, when he, when he established his, his salutogenic uh, research program, he was also able to get funding for it for the next 10 years. In fact, it was an idea I always had that there are people, the original story is based on research on people who have survived the Holocaust uh, during the Second World War, who survived, women who survived this. And I was always thinking that there are say, um, certainly people who would be interested in, in this story and combine it to creating new research. And, 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 and Geir Bauer was able to, to get this funding for, for, for the next 10 years to run, run his own research program in, and also the Global Working Group. I'm very happy because I'm leaving a ship that has full sails and it will sail better after, my, after I depart. <laughs> Again, um, uh, if you talk about uh, the core concept of, of salutogenesis, it's an interesting and important to understand that this concept, sense of coherence, is is, is strongly connected to all four dimensions of health. And the four dimensions are physical health, social health, mental health, and, and also existential health or, or spiritual health, if you want to use that, that, that dimension. And the strongest, strongest connection is to mental health. And this is also an area where we have for a long time had very little theory, very little consistent ways of dealing with this. But these, this strong connection to, to mental health and quality of life, and, uh, and also we can actually predict, predict uh, people's, uh, people's future going if we have an idea what their sense of coherence is. And therefore, I always say it would be interesting and important to think how you can actually establish this kind of thinking early in life and even maybe before birth, which is sort of my, my, my next area of interest. So this is just saying, here you are, here's the concept, and here, here's the ability of the concept. And we, if we look at a thing like, um, like health promotion, or what health promotion and uh, public health wanted to achieve, we, had, we have the health for all strategy, to speaking about adding, adding years to life and adding life to years, the two dimensions of, of health. One is sort of the classic, uh, to reduce disease, adding years to life, making people able to live long, but adding life to years is the dimension saying, saying adding quality to lo of life, adding mental well-being and, and good perceived health and so on. And 
if you develop this salutogenic capacity over your life, you will not only live longer, you will also live with with a good mental health and good well-being. Uh, many times people say if people grow old, uh, they are a burden to society. What we see is that that the, this capacity, if you can develop it, it develops throughout life, and the high the 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 highest mean values we find in the old people, meaning that the wisdom of life is is inside the, the old people, and we should actually lose that more, much more. And if you live long and have a good well-being, you are not going to be a great burden to society, as so many times is said about the elderly in society. If you look at the areas of where we have success, for instance, if you look at health behavior, we know that parents who have a, a strong, uh, strong salutogenic capacity, sense of coherence, uh, uh, induce uh, cr uh, constructive health behaviors in, the, in their children. It is originally a stress theory and it's good for management of st stress and life events and also the area where there's a lot of thinking and research right now in the world is chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases and here we also see that if you have this capacity you manage these conditions much better. So this is sort of uh, 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 something saying that if we work with this perspective we can do a lot on the whole scene and and uh, just doing it with different if you look at the effectiveness of this for instance we have looked at people who fall out of the workforce in Finland uh, and what that cost it's about 30 million euros per year and that is as much as as one working day for the whole workforce for a whole year in Finland and if we would be able to deal with this we would actually reduce the costs and when we look at at uh, the salutogenic capacity, if this is strong, people who, who actually fall out early from, from working life will return to working life. And the other thing comes from, from, uh, from midwifery and birth, and what we can see in, uh, in United States, they use 18 billion dollars per year for caesarean sections without any medical indications. And this is of course not good for the mothers, it's the high risk around it, it's not good for the child. And what we see is that women who have developed this salutogenic capacity uh, prefer natural birth. And this is Sue Down who is, who is uh, running a big European or international project, cost project, uh, financed from the European Union. And uh, she is a midwife and she's the star of midwifery. And she's, she's heavily infected by salutogenesis, I can tell you. <laughs> and, uh, and, and she's really, uh, I, I'm in this group because I, have, I, I know about salutogenesis and I am using this in this interdisciplinary group. Many of them are, are midwives, so this is an area. But here we have two examples of, of, of reducing costs for healthcare. Healthcare is really in trouble in the future because it's going to become too expensive to do it what, as we have done it before. Hmm? What we are talking about is uh, not only one side or two, we are working with two sides. Okay, time is running like I don't know what. We are talking about both the pathology and both the, the salutogenic part and they actually work together, these two sides. So you can't deal with just one, you have to deal with both. So this is a, a picture where we try to put both of them together. One person who was, was, was important, Hege in, in Norway, did something she called a self-tuning model and it was the first time, it was an interview of, of, of 11 uh, uh, public health nurses who were able to, who, who had, uh, who were working and they were, she found them by asking colleagues, do you know somebody who works in, in, in public health as a public nurse in a very difficult situation but still is flourishing and, and thriving? And she made deep interviews with these nurses. And on one hand she could, she could show that the nursing, uh, and the co sense of calling, the job engagement, the, the sort of Florence Nightingale side of the whole was, was a power that moved and and made it interesting and made committed people to work. On the other hand, it could also lead to 
uh, you take too many challenges, you break down, and you can't really, really manage with life. And then she's discovered that this sort of pathogenic and salutogenic path, they go together, and the salutogenic, the positive or strong power actually lifts this, this these these uh, these nurses out of their out of their misery, so to say, and she said it's a sort of a self-reflection where they where they reflect on what can I do in the situation. It came out that out of these eleven nurses, all of them had been on the brink of breakdown. One had broken down. That was the only male in the group, by the way. But the the ten of they all had been sort of. Now it's too much for me. Now I can't do. Now I can't manage. What shall I do? And then through this kind of self-reflection, they moved on and 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 were able to continue and committed. Think about what kind of workforce you could if you could use this instrument to to find the night, right nurses for night places. But I'm not recommending that. But. I, Again, uh, we have the disease side and we have the resource side. This is Georg Bauer's slides from uh, one, one week ago in Stockholm in, uh, in the European uh, Public Health Conference where he presented his, his, his theory of expanding the cellulogenic theory. And it's very much the same thing. We have a one side of job demands that can meet the negative health. You have resources that could, through uh, the sense of coherence, uh, uh, protect you, and we have this sort of uh, p p play with pathogenesis and, and salutogenesis on both sides. The only thing I complain about this model, he's talking about positive health. I don't think positive health exists. Health is positive in its sense. If you use it in scientific word, you said, should say health, and the opposite is contra-health like quality of life and contra, and, and disease and contra disease. It's the way you should talk to it. It's, but they like this positive health word. And I can understand, you know, it's like flourishing. It's easy for people to understand. For, but in science, science, you should not use that. We have this constant discussion in the global working group. And I'm of the opinion you don't need that kind of a word. Okay, and this is again how, how, how you ha have the interplay over time with, between resources, risks, and, 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 and the scientific part of it leading to, 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 a, to a model where we again have the red and the green and, and a simplified model that you can read about in, in the handbook on salutogenesis. I don't have time to go into detail, but I think it's good to put this up, and if you are interested, you can go and read in the handbook. This is one of my, I like to play with words. Health for all is the public health theory, the public health uh, policy that came in, in the 80s and it's WHO's first time move out of, of, the, of the healthcare system saying that health is a global issue. Health for all was that strategy. And to implement this, we had health promotion and the Ottawa Charter, which sort of goes like a, an app on health promotion. If you want to do health for all, you use the, the Ottawa Charter to, 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 to say how are you going to do it. And then we have salutogenesis as the theory as that goes as an app on this one also. I should have been able to put these together because it's so funny. SOC is sense of coherence. So I, I think yeah, you need this in order to get that thing going. So public health would have great use of this, and this is my next challenge also. How can we make public health understand this, and how understand that we have an effective and good, good way of doing this, and then again, how can we get medicine to understand that this is, this is a way of, of complementing what we are doing. Uh, time is still. Can I go on for a little while? I am looking at biological measurements for sense of coherence because I know as soon as I have that you know uh, the medicine is it oh, wow this is something like yeah. child psychiatry was a complete mess but then all of a sudden you have you had sort of neuroscience and all of a sudden it's sort of a good and, and we have to do this this is a, a study of of, of uh, monozygotous uh, twins and what you could see when they are separated, you, there are a lot of studies of that. We could see that if they lived in a, in a, in a, 
in an environment that was supportive, they developed a strong sense of coherence and they de de developed a salutogenic capacity. This is the first time we can talk about salutogenetics and I'm sure there's more. This is a big Finnish study. 3,000 uh, 3, couples of twins were in this study, so this is really pung, its power in this, in this study. I always like this picture also because I think about women with this big big chromosome, two X's, and the men with the little Y, you know. Why do we have that one, you know? Okay. Um, I am looking into how neuroscience, uh, going into childhood, going into pregnancy, and going into the period when, when you, are, you are sort of becoming a human being. And one concept that has been very interesting for me is mentalization. It's actually the ability of a person to understand and, and, and conceive that another person is think, thinking and reflecting and being able to think and reflect over this can, or can, as far as we know, happen already in pregnancy. So mentalization is one model that looks very much like the salutogenic and sense of coherence model. And this is an area where I try to get a bit Sue down and some other people look at this and try to figure out and make a, a, a new sort of approach to this early period of life, which would be very, very good to, to know about. We have another thing. Um, Oxytocin, I think you spell it with an E in English, I'm not sure. Kerstin Uvnes is, is Swedish. She was one of the first researchers in the area. She is also in this cost action project. And we are trying to look how can we actually actually look at the salutogenic model on one side and oxytocin and what it does. The problem with oxytocin and studies of it was that the measurements were so diffuse and so wrong when you started off 30 years ago to measure this. So we have to go through all this. The first paper we had to write was about how do you measure and what is the normal case of oxytocin. But this is again one way of talking about the biological part and, and a psycho-emotional psycho model binding this together. And this is sort of my, my sort of, my, my, what do you call it? I'm, I'm aiming at, at getting medicine to, to accept and understand uh, that we are doing things that could be actually could be doing. But this is also work in progress. I can't say too much about this at the time being. This is again more, more practical. It is a study in German-speaking countries in Europe where, uh, uh, where a qualitative study looked at, at midwives and, and interviewed them and came out with two groups of midwives, the salutogenic mother and child-oriented midwives who were actually focusing on the child and the mother in the pregnancy. And, and then they had the technical instrumental-oriented midwife. Okay, that's good. It was interesting. We got this, and, uh, uh, this study uh, showing these two groups. But then the, one of, our, of the persons in this cost action project was a technician who had been di done doing thermal images. And what she did, she went out to, to make thermal images of these midwives. And, uh, and the salutogenic ones were glowing and warm, and the technical one was blue and cold. And, and this is really the first time we could see that. This study is going, to, is continuing and is broadening out. But for one, again, we have a, we have a concrete measure of something here, which we have the story behind. And I think this is just a wonderful idea, idea a wonderful way of going. There, I, uh, and there are many people involved in this study also. Okay. Um, I, I have, I always had something about health literacy which I find uh, a very difficult area because it's so diffuse. They are bring great, bringing health promotion back to 30 years back in time and behaving like we did in those times. I said, come on, come on, you could learn from what has happened in 30 years. And now in Europe they actually are, are picking up the idea of salutogenesis as a theory for health literacy also. So uh, and I think this is, as I said, you, if you need 150 instruments to measure workplace, workplace health promotion, when we can do it in salutogenic 
uh, with just one instrument. I think it's, it's, it's something strange about this area. Also, this, this, usually these different concepts on health education never think about the health part of it. They only think about the second part. And this is also true when it comes to literacy. No more, I'm, I'm almost at peace with them because they start thinking like I think. But in Europe, at least, in the States, they don't. Okay, I think uh, one of the last things I want to say is that we are setting up now a European uh, uh, conference for IUHP in, in next year in Trondheim, implementing health promotion in the life course, the involvement, I have spelled it wrong, of, of practice and research. It will be in September, and in this conference we will also have uh, the Global Working Group of Salutogenesis will have their own track on the midday of the conference. We are inviting also health literacy because we want to have the discussion and, and healthy settings to do that and also to work together on this issue. So this is a confer upcoming conference before the World Conference in, in 2019. So please, if you are interested, if you want to learn something, this will be a, a forum where a lot of people will come who are interested in this area, in health promotion and salutogenesis and other areas of this. I think that was about the last. We, the production of books are increasing. I don't have all the books here that I have done. But now we go back to the beginning, to, to what goes on in salutogenesis. Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs>